Hello to all of you out there. My My name is Amanda Chung and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology here at UBC and I am so excited to be giving this guest lecture in the course COVID-19 and Society. Before we dive into today's topic, I wanted to take a moment to commend all of you for devoting the last part of your summer to trying to critically understand the numerous social problems that this pandemic has posed. And one common theme that has cut across the various modules of this course is that while the pandemic and the challenges that it has presented are certainly unprecedented, COVID-19 is also exacerbating or making worse a number of long-standing inequalities that have been around for a very long time. Today, what we're going to be talking about is the relationship between COVID-19 and racism, specifically anti-Asian sentiment. There are two parts to the lecture today. In the first half, we're going to get a lay of the land in terms of the kinds of racially motivated acts and anti-Asian discourses that have been circulating within Canada and in uh, Vancouver specifically. In part two, we're going to be talking about how this trend and these attitudes are not new. And we're going to be doing this by contextualizing contemporary expressions of anti-Asian sentiment within a long history of Asian exclusion in Canada. Then in closing, we're going to briefly go over some sociological concepts and theoretical tools that will help us understand the causes and the consequences of anti-Asian racism in the wake of COVID-19. Specifically, we're going to be thinking about the nation state not just as a geographical body, but a symbolic one as well. And we're going to talk about how political actors impose and fortify symbolic boundaries between supposed insiders and outsiders in order to justify the exclusion of racialized minorities from the nation's geographical territory. Okay, let's move on to part one in which we're going to briefly set the stage for the rest of our discussion. You may or may not have seen in the news in recent months stories about acts of violence or expressions of discrimination against Asians in response to COVID-19. For example, the Vancouver Police Department has reported a staggering uptick in the number of hate crimes that have been reported to the department, many of them targeting Asian people and communities. For example, major landmarks across the city, including the lion statues in historic Chinatown in Vancouver, were vandalized with graffiti and duct tape. A memorial bench paying tribute to a deceased Chinese Vancouverite was defaced with derogatory comments against China. This bench is located in Queen Elizabeth Park, which many of you uh, have probably been to. The media has also reported a number of acts of violence and aggression against Asians in Vancouver, including for example, the story where an Asian woman was verbally threatened and spat on while she was just walking down the street. There was a lot of coverage recently about a woman who was violently assaulted after trying to stand up to and defend two Asian women from a man on the bus who was allegedly uh, saying things like, go back to your country, that's where it all started. And a 92-year-old Asian man with dementia in East Vancouver was shoved to the ground in a convenience store, causing him to hit his head after being the subject of racist insults by this man captured in the security camera pictured here. 
And these are just a few examples of a broader upswing in anti-Asian acts in Canada and around the world. And the explanation isn't so simple as saying that COVID-19 made people racist overnight. Rather, the pandemic has created shifts in the political, social, and cultural environments that have created a space of permission for racist sentiments to be expressed outwardly and acted upon. And the kinds of discourses or the words and the modes of reprimand representation that uh, political actors have been putting out and circulating uh, have a big role in shaping these spaces of permission. For example, conservative MP Derek Sloan posted a video to social media in which he questioned Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, for her loyalty to Canada by saying that she had, quote, failed Canadians and by asking if she works for Canada or for China. And in an accompanying tweet, he wrote, Dr. Tam must go. Canada must remain sovereign over decisions. The UN, who, the WHO, and Chinese communist propaganda must never again have a say over Canada's public health. Now, for the record, Dr. Tam is a Canadian citizen who was born in Hong Kong and educated in, raised in the UK and has had residencies and fellowships at the University of Alberta and right here at UBC and is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And yet, despite her incredible portfolio of achievements, which she obtained during her long career in public health in Canada, MP Sloan implied that her Chinese ethnicity rendered her untrustworthy and threatening to the Canadian people, while simultaneously fashioning the Chinese government as an antagonistic force in the global fight against the pandemic. And across the border, United States President Donald Trump, in addition to handling the United States' response to the pandemic in a disastrous way, has discursively encouraged and thereby widened a space of permission for anti-Asian sentiment to bloom during this period. And one way that he has done this is by referring to COVID-19 as the Chinese virus, repeatedly over social media and in public statements. And a Washington Post photographer even caught a close-up of his notes back in March for a speech uh, with his coronavirus task force in which he crossed out the word corona and sharpied in the word Chinese. Now, this is the end of part one.